In 1937 the German architect Walter Gropius arrived with his family in the United States. After receiving a job offer from Harvard University, he settled in Lincoln, Massachusetts, a half-hour drive from the university campus. On this side the founder of the Bauhaus will build his own house. A project of modest scale, but of great impact in the architecture of the 20th century. Helen Storrow, a philanthropist and patron of various artists of the time, offered the architect the necessary funds and her land in Lincoln, so that he could freely choose how and where to build the house. The house sits on the crest of a hill in the center of an apple orchard, with spectacular views of the New England countryside. The property fits discreetly into the landscape, yet paradoxically overlooks its surroundings. Rigorously and thoroughly planned, the house is the result of an amalgam of concepts that unify and give rise to the project. On the one hand, the principles of the modern movements supported by the Bauhaus are used, and on the other, the techniques, materials and aesthetics of the regional and traditional architecture of the place are applied. The design of the Gropius House is consistent with the philosophies of the Bauhaus, where design and beauty derive from function and practicality. Through an intelligent construction process and the use of industrial materials, the freedom of the floor plan, fluidity and openness to the landscape are achieved, as well as a calm and minimal aesthetic. The project preserves the scale and the material identity with the surroundings. The exterior volumes are clad in brick and wooden tablets, these materials are combined with black profiles on the windows and glass blocks that evoke a sense of stability and balance between the old and the new, the traditional and the modern, between New England and Europe. The house, distributed over two floors, presents orthogonal lines and a flat roof, characteristics that included within the white modern movement. However, the structure of the house is made of light wooden frames, traditional in New England, which are covered with redwood clapboards painted white. Only in this case are the pieces arranged vertically instead of horizontally, which gives the body a subtle texture and allows a better solution to the corners, giving the house a continuous envelope character. The central volume of the house is composed of a clearly geometric prism, to which different elements are added that alter the basic envelope, such as the cantilever of the entrance, arranged obliquely to the main plane, and the freestanding staircase that gives access to the terrace. Similarly, the main entrance and the service entrance are delimited by stone galleries, which project beyond the base of the volume. The project is based on an open spatial organization, where light filters across the place through the large windows that connect the house with its surroundings. The terraces and large windows provide a close relationship between the interior and exterior spaces. Upon entering the property, the visitor first finds himself in front of the old garage, and as he enters the property in the middle of large groves of trees, the house emerges in the center of the lot. The first perception of the house is that of a single compact volume, juxtaposed with more ethereal exterior elements that have a greater interaction with the immediate surroundings. Gropius designed the garden space through a zoning of diffuse limits. From a clearly planned landscape around the house, to a less cultivated space in between, until arriving at the edges of the property to the natural and agricultural state that existed on the land prior to the work.
Throughout the exterior tour, a unique treatment is perceived in each facade, in accordance with its orientation and its immediate surroundings. The main facade, oriented almost to the north, has narrow windows to maintain the privacy of the users, as well as for reasons of climate protection. While in the rest of the facades the windows will be wider, allowing to enjoy the views and receive the heat and light in the interior spaces. The east facade is the simplest of the four elevations. Rectangular in shape, its landscape windows and the recessed access to the kitchen generate an asymmetrical composition. The south and west facades, adjacent to the garden areas with the greatest use by the family, are also the ones with the most complex compositions. On the south facade the volume, although still recognizable, loses its clarity due to additions and subtractions made by the architect, mainly depending on the orientation. The portico, which takes advantage of the refreshing breezes from the east and west in summer, extends outside the volume towards the garden. More than half of the west facade is compassed by the absence of a wall. On the first floor the large window of the living room occupies almost two-thirds of the elevation, while on the second floor, the opening to the terrace is interrupted only by the continuation of the wide wall containing the fireplace. The main entrance to the house is through a diagonal eave, which extends to welcome the visitor. Under this elongated and flat roof, we find the first shelter of the house. A small platform barely separated from the ground by a few steps, and limited by a narrow glass block wall, which provides protection from the wind and rain. Through a door perpendicular to the facade, the user enters the house itself. A small cubicle as a wardrobe leads to the vestibule. Upon entering, the space expands to the left where there is a curved staircase, its black metal handrail is the only handcrafted element in the entire house. The rest of the materials used are also unusual for the domestic environment of the time. Pressed cork for the floor and acoustic plaster for the ceiling. The main feature of the vestibule is its function as the axis of the house. From here you can access all the rooms of the house the study, the living room, the dining room, the kitchen, the utility room, the bathrooms and through the staircase, to the bedrooms on the upper floor. On the right wall there is a door leading to the study. The room is confined by a glass block wall that separates the studio from the dining room, without blocking the light in any direction, which adds luminosity to the small space. This wall breaks and compresses the room, with the intention of inviting the user to move towards the living room. Once the threshold is crossed, the space is surprisingly transformed. The living room forms a continuum, although divisible through a curtain with the dining room. It is the most spatially generous room in the house. Large windows frame the surrounding landscape and expand the interior into the garden. The door on the east side of the dining room leads to the home's pantry, an elongated space that culminates in the kitchen of equal dimensions. Both rooms are small but were efficiently designed by Gropius, with the ideas of economy of space and functionality in mind. An opening indicated on the north wall connects the pantry to the first floor vestibule, as the user ascends the curved staircase to arrive at a small upper vestibule. To the left is the master bedroom, which is divided into two spaces. The bedroom and the dressing room, the latter being the entrance to the room. Gropius used glass to separate the two areas and create the illusion of greater spaciousness. The guest room is mainly made up of furniture brought from Dessa, which determine the dimensions of the room. To the west, the upstairs complements the bedroom of Adi, the couple's daughter. With an L-shaped floor plan, the space is separated in two by a curtain. A glass door connects the daughter's room with the west terrace, a large semi-covered space, topped by slender beams. 
in addition to generating a rhythmic pattern, they serve to shade the entrance of light. As with the exterior of the house, Gropius uses a minimalist color palette throughout the interior, consisting of black, white, pale grays and earth tones, with only faint red accents throughout the house. The furnishings of the house include pieces from Gropius's former home in Dessa, and from his Bauhaus office. Of particular note are the double desk in the study, the complete furnishings in the master and guest rooms, and the desk in the daughter's room. In turn, we find other pieces also designed at the Bauhaus by other teachers or students, such as the dining room chairs by Marcel Brewer, and the round table by Gustav Hissenflick. The Gropius House, a simple and carefully planned dwelling, was the home of Walter Gropius and his family until his death in 1969, from then on it was officially transferred to the owner of the land. Being so captivated by the work of the architect she granted parts of her land to other architects to create establishments similar to those of Gropius. In 2000, the house became a national monument, a testament to the influence of Walter Gropius's work, and an outstanding and influential example of modern architecture and landscape architecture within the United States.